start with a metaphor. If you will study, the physicists would study um, uh, separate air particles and will try to study the chemistry and the physics of it and so on, they will never ever discover that when those particles gather together, they will propagate sound. Propagating sound in the air is a property of a group of particles, not of a single particle. <clears throat> so you can discover it while studying individuals. The same with communities or groups with the Ashoka Fellows work. It, there is a hidden potential. There is embedded a tremendous energy at the bottom of the pyramid. The question is how to release that and how groups operate. Here is an anecdote. Uh, Google launched several years ago an Aristotle program because he wa Google wanted to understand what makes groups being more productive and more creative. It lasted for years and it failed. The leader had to resign. Uh, a, new, uh, a new woman who took over the program, Morozowski, she struggled a lot, but finally she found a way to to, to get to the point. So, in a nutshell, no intelligence level, even if you have the IQ's highest possible in the world, in the group, the results don't differ significantly from randomly selected group. The emotional extraversion or introversion or the portfolio of accomplishments, of being a leader of big organization before. They tried all that and compared groups full of such people compared with, with control groups. No result. No difference whatsoever. Very often the difference was on the opposite way. After, I think, a decade of research, they found two, re two factors, two mechanisms, which really differ productive groups from any other. The first, and they have nothing, those two, um, two factors have nothing to do with personality, with cre individual creativity, with individual intelligence. The first is that uh, it, the group should have uh, in the, the culture the tradition to be open also as for the personal life and feel secure to tell about personal stories as well, not only be focused totally 100% on the topic, on the challenges, on the task. Second is that uh, they have to um, have the same amount of time speaking over a long period of time. So it doesn't mean that I have to speak the same five minutes as any other group member today. I can speak more today, less tomorrow, but at the end of the day, when, when, uh, when you sum up all the, t the times of speaking for all, all group members, they, they should be equal. And those two factors make a productive group. So you, you don't need to have super intelligence. People. You don't need to have super creative people, you have to have those two factors. And so this is a new science, a new opening for trying to understand the group dynamics. Also, um, it is important that the, um, the group has uh, some environment which is totally open, which means some chaos, which means random connections, which means uh, freely interacting persons. But if we think deeper, it, it sounds nice, but it, it has some consequences. It means that the leader should have the guts to let people be totally free and interact in a totally random way. So, um, my goodness. If you are now tight with your business plan, would you now let people go and talk and interact? Wouldn't that actually bring your firm to bankruptcy? And here there are several examples around the world uh, of business multi-billion uh, dollars annual revenue. 
firms which do that. One of them is a Brazilian, Ashoka friend actually, I talked with him and he knows about Ashoka, uh, Ricardo Semler, who started launch Semco, Semco is a multi-billion dollar organization and he let people interact totally free, come up with their own ideas. Uh, the ideas are bottom up and the firms is, is are following the ideas of the group. The groups assemble and disassemble. The leaders are with new ideas, gather some others around them and so on. And, and this is successful. They overcame the major economic crisis in Brazil just because of just delegating power and creating this sort of chaos. I'm using this word chaos because I, the, the premise for my studies is complexity theory. Complexity theory is based on free interaction of elements or individuals on the lower level. And this free interaction actually leads to some new emergent phenomena on the higher level, often a jump. So that they interact. So this is not an A, B, A to B, B to C. So, uh, sort of logic. It's A influencing B, B is uh, reinforcing C and C in a feedback with A and creating a loop which actually comes up suddenly with a new idea. Also in complexity, why complexity is good, uh, good uh, premise for uh, understanding Ashoka? It's because here small interventions, small impulses can deliver very big results. Uh, systemic changes with very small investments. Whereas we usually in the normal logic, not a complexity logic, we think that only big investments bring big results. So we need to, to raise my big money or get big loans to get big results. Here it's the opposite. And there are several thrilling stars of Ashoka Fellows starting from scratch, from zero, from nothing, with a very small impulse uh, getting to some immense results. So they, let me tell you one story. Burkina Faso is one of the poorest countries in the world. It's on a desert. The desert is gloomy, full of stones, and um, and people are actually jobless all around the country. And a very difficult, tough situation. There was a artist, a sculptor, who suffered that his country is so in such a bad position and he uh, w sort of walked outside the city, had a walk on the desert, the desert is terribly gloomy and just some grayish stones and at some point he just fell asleep with his head over the stone and when he waked up the first thing he did, he took the tools for sculpting and sculptured in, on that stone a sculpture. And that looked very nice in the nature, in the sculpture, and he called some friends and each friend took another stone and they sculpted and made their own sculptures. Then they decided to make, uh, to, to ask some African sculptors and then they started annual gatherings around sculpting the desert. The end result, to make the long story short, after a decade, there is an annual international, so American, French, and so on, best sculptors of the world gather there, have fun, dancing, have beer, but also each of them takes a stone, and there is a lot of stone supply around, and makes sculptures on the stone. So the sculptures are there in the nature, not taken to the museum. And around that, of course, a lot of businesses appear, like excursion, buses, food supply, and sleep, bed and breakfast, and so on, so on. So this boosted the economy a lot. A small impulse just waked up and started to, scale, to, to carve the, the stone. This a very small impulse created an immense change and economic and social change. So that's why the complexity theory makes sense in thinking about uh, the um, organizations, about groups. 
It doesn't mean that always chaos is positive because this uh, A to B, B to C, C to A back uh, feedback loops may also lead to some destruction. So the, my question for the research was to uh, what, what are the conditions, the preconditions to make this chaos to order processes being constructive. And this is again uh, social capital around having uh, being uh, giving people the creativity impulses and so on. Uh, the the Visa International uh, founder Peter De Hock, I think, he wrote the book that we are entering a new key order era, chaos order key order. That he did, the, the, and he, he wrote that the success of Visa, the Visa business, the credit card, was because he opened up dialogue, he opened up the chaos. So chaos to order, chaotic, is something which really is promising to, um, to lead to completely new solutions. Uh, you trust people, you give them power, you make them discuss, you make them encounter, you, you open up this chaos. And one more example, there is this Morning Star company, which is the biggest uh, world uh, tomato processing company. And they again, they discuss in groups, they, they mm, vote for their own group leaders, they take tasks, but the thing is that they have the, their own performance, uh, ag not agreement, but they sort of, um, each year they, work with their peers what they would accomplish, the, what they want to, want to accomplish. And this is the agenda, that they, they actually are, uh, this is reviewed by the peers and all that is peer-to-peer -peer process, no top-down control. They even can go on travels, it's like for instance if they want to go to Amsterdam to learn something, please go. You are free. If you want to buy some equipment, you are free. No control. And what happened is that this trust and engagement in this tomato game, they call it tomato game, makes them committed, loyal, and really limiting the resources to really the necessary ones. So there are multiple examples from the social field, especially from Ashoka Fellows, but also from the business sector, that um, creating this freedom to interact gives real power to the bottom of the pyramid where you have the total energy and unbelievable nuclear power of new ideas released. People are usually egocentric in a way, not necessarily because they are such, but because all the way they are hired, the process, the, the tradition, it's all on ego. You are the leader, you have to lead, you are on the front stage, you have to give this, give this speech, you have to go to the um, TV or media and so on. The leader, the leader is perceived as someone on the front stage and talking and inspiring. The, 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 this charisma of leadership is understood as an ego charisma. Whereas uh, here you have to step back. You are the new kind of leader I am writing about in my book, Empowering Leadership of Tomorrow. The leader of tomorrow is someone who is setting up and launching a process, some dynamics, which is done on its own. So um, it is um, self-perpetuating. So the, the real challenge for the new reader is to how to trigger such a dynamic that will be self-perpetuating so that I don't need to be at the front stage. I can go somewhere else on a different level, higher level or whatever, but people take it over and they are the heroes. They are in the news. They are talking about their discoveries. So you you have to resign from from being, you know, ego uh, centered. You have to say, okay, I'm happy not because I am the the one who is in the central point, but because I left behind me something irreversible, durable, long lasting. Give power to people; they have it, and now I'm going further on. Uh, that's a total shift. 
that's a psychological, probably one of the most difficult things in our world. Also, I think it's difficult to understand for many leaders, for many social leaders, for many leaders who are nice and so on, they still think in the category, okay, okay, but, but I, am, I, I have to be responsible. I, I am with media, I, yeah, I. It's something completely different. Setting the process, launching the process, setting things up, making people take over, it's different than being on the front stage. Usually it starts with one single experience, even small, when you are happy watching people take over and you're launching this dynamic, self-perpetuating dynamics. Uh, it, it, even if it, it is in your family, even if you see your children getting some inspiration, but then doing things on their own, and trying to translate it also to, to your work environment. So have such an experience or study such experience. So again, I refer to this book, Empowering Leadership of Tomorrow. There, there is uh, more than a dozen examples, most of them from business and social sector of people who had the guts actually to limit their ego. This is a different kind of a leader, totally different. I call it an empowering leader. A leader, again, uh, there is a need of a leader because you need to launch this, you need to inspire with the, the basic ideas. But then th this inspiration and the inspiration of trusting you. People come to Ricardo Semler, what should we do? You know best, just go to your peers and discuss. Then uh, also if people are stuck, not telling them what to do, but making them role play or make some simulations or some metaphors, play with metaphors, show them that the group can find the solution. So uh, there are many, many ways. And um, I know fellows around the world I interviewed as a second opinion of fellows from nearly all continents and over a hundred, and most of them have this instinct to do it. This is something like an instinct, but you also can get trained in with it. I think simulations and building models and playing with models which could be um, translating your environment, your problem, other reality, this, uh, this is the way to educate actually children in schools also. Uh, the simulations can be done uh, in, in three ways in fantasy, in role play, like, for instance, if you want to predict the future, um, someone said that don't make prediction, especially when they concern the future. But if you want to predict your future, you, in a linear way, in the complex world, you can't predict the normal. You can dance it only. So you can create a space where people simulate the situation after 10 years. You take roles of people, what happens then in their field and so on, and discuss as if they were 10 years ahead. Also children at school can play. So your family after 10 years, and your job after 10 years, then play, and one play the father, another the mother, and so on. So the, 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 this is uh, the third way, this is more for high school and college, is to mm, simulate on computers. So there is a new field of science, which is computer simulation, especially when you want to simulate processes which are difficult to experiment in real life, like panic in the cinema. So you can simulate it on the computer and see what happens, what sort of light is best, what's, and so on. And they, they do it. I was also involved in that. So there are three very basic ways of playing with simulations and also in education.